Grain shipments are months and months and millions of tons behind. Piles of crop are stranded on farms across the prairies. Some is now spoiling. Feed users and domestic processors can't get the supplies they need. Terminals are half empty. Ships are waiting. Demurrage charges are uh, horrendous. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to stand here today to speak to Bill C-30, the Fair Rail for Grain Farmers Act. Today we debate this important bill that has the singular purpose of improving our supply chain and rail logistics in Canada. Since its introduction on Wednesday, the Ministers of Agriculture and Transport have been out on the ground meeting with stakeholders in that supply chain and working hard to ensure that this gets done properly and quickly. The current transportation challenges affect all players in the supply chain, and it is essential that Canadian shippers remain competitive in domestic and international markets. <clears throat> Our government is focused on a way forward that will benefit all shippers, selling every commodity from grain to oil, and continue to grow our resource economy. That's why we are taking immediate action to get all commodities moving faster through legislation and regulations designed to increase supply chain transparency, strengthen contracts between producers and shippers, and help ensure the entire grain handling and transportation system is working at peak capacity. This legislation addresses the immediate needs of our economy and longer-term challenges because our economy needs a system that works today and tomorrow with the capacity to move what has grown. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we're counting on all sides of the House of Commons to do the right thing and help us to implement these critical measures as quickly as possible. Our economy depends on it. As we all know, last, year's farmers, uh, last year farmers delivered a record crop, a third higher than last year's and 50% higher than average. As many have said, if this type of performance is expected to be the new normal, we must prepare for that. That is what this legislation is about, Mr. Speaker. Farmers have not been able to deliver their grain to port or to customers, meaning that they do not have cash to finance their operations or storage capacity for next year's crop. A record $5 billion worth of grain could be sitting in farmers' bins heading into the next crop year. That's why earlier this month we brought forward an order in Council under the Canada Transportation Act to stabilize the national transportation system and to get grain moving to port. The Order and Council requires Canadian National and Canadian Pacific Railways to move a minimum quantity of Western regulated grain each week. We are now building upon that Order and Council. Nous modifierons la loi sur les trans we will amend the Canada Transportation Act so that it includes, it includes the power to prescribe requirements in terms of volume as needed to extend the inter-switching distance to 160 kilometers for all commodities in the prairies, to amend the Canada Grain Act to regulate provisions concerning grain contracts, to require further information to increase the transparency and performance of railway lines, ports, and terminals, to establish a regulation power to give uh, more precision and clarity to the agreements on to the service level agreements as sh all shippers have called for these tangible and global measures will come into force immediately after they have been adopted under this bill we will amend the Canada Transportation Act to set out minimum volumes of grain in extraordinary circumstances that railways are required to transport at the joint recommendation of the Minister of Transport and the Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. This change would provide greater predictability for shippers and producers, supporting specific volume performance requirements and ensuring the supply chain is prepared to respond to peak demand. Second, our government is creating the regulatory authority to enable the Canadian Transportation Agency to extend inter-switching distances to 160 kilometres from 30 kilometres for all commodities on the prairies. Interswitching is an operation performed by railway companies where one carrier picks up cars from a shipper and drops off these cars to another carrier that performs the line haul. Increasing the access that farmers and elevators have to the lines of competing railway companies will increase competition among railways for business and give shippers more transportation options. 
Up to 150 elevators would then have access to more than one railway compared to only 14 right now. This will increase competition among railways as well as the grain elevators for farmers' business. Third, we will amend the Canadian, the, excuse me, the Canada Grain Act to strengthen contracts between producers and shippers. Regulatory provisions could be created to require that grain companies compensate producers if they do not honour their contracts. Fourth, we are establishing regulatory power to add greater specificity to service level agreements as asked for by all shippers. We will do this by defining in regulations which operational requirements would be mandatory in these agreements. Mr. Speaker, these are the immediate measures we are taking in this bill to get the grain moving now and over the coming months, but we are not stopping there. We will also require the railways to deliver more timely and detailed data on grain movement. This will help in monitoring the performance of the supply chain. The Canadian Transportation Agency will also gather information from all grain supply chain partners on shipping capacities and plans prior to each new crop year. This bill will allow for the adoption of clear and realistic solutions to ensure that Canadian shippers have access to a world-class logistical system that will provide for foreseeable and timely shipment of farm and other commodity, commodities of Canada towards the markets. We will also be announcing today that the Canada Transportation Act will undergo an expedited review starting with the railway sector. This expedited review will consist of evaluating solutions to structural problems experienced in the grain supply chain and to de determine how to amend the Canada Transportation Act to create a more flexible system. Working together, these measures will strengthen contracts between producers and shippers, improve performance by railways and help ensure the entire supply chain is working at full capacity. Let me quote the Minister of Agriculture for Alberta, who said, quote, We are pleased that the federal government has brought forward the Fair Rail for Green Farmers Act, which addresses some of our concerns and would help strengthen rail transportation system performance in the immediate and long term. And Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Agriculture for Manitoba, who said, quote, The Manitoba government supports this move as it means trains will be able to travel longer distances along other rail companies' tracks and will improve Manitoba's access to the port in Churchill, as well as important U.S. markets. And Mr. Speaker, one last quote from the Canadian Canola Growers Association, which said, quote, the measures announced in the bill, along with other efforts recently implemented, demonstrate that government is listening to farmers' concerns. Mr. Speaker, this legislation is not the final step. Our government will continue to engage the full value chain and the provinces to look at challenges of transporting this year's record harvest and to identify all and any improvements moving forward. At the same time, our government will continue to build a stronger grain sector through aggressive trade and innovation agenda. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, we're looking forward to the debate in the House today. Of course, this bill will be moving uh, to committee um, as soon as possible, but I do look to my colleagues within the other parties to support this important legislation that is in front of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're going The new measures of this bill are the extension of inter-switching limits from 30 to 160 kilometers in Alberta, Manitoba, and Saskatchewan. The provisions relative to shipping contracts, especially as concerns penalties in case of broken contracts and uh, arbitration of disputes, and the regulatory powers of the Canada Transportation Act regarding elements that will be observed to determine whether shippers are respecting agreements with regard to quantities to be shipped. I will get into detail more on the content of the bill later, but first I will provide a bit of context. For the past few months, grain farmers have, uh, grain producers have been very frustrated because of transportation problems. The problems that they are experiencing are lowering the quality of their grain and uh, lowering prices as well. And they are afraid that they will not be able to ship coming harvests. The value of the grain that is being stored and that cannot be moved is worth between 14.5 and $20 billion. This 
there, sh there could be a delay of some 17 to 27 million metric tons. This situa situation is especially troubling because business partners are losing trust. Not everyone be aware, may be aware of this, but for those who live every day with the consequences of this delay in grain transport can tell you that it is a dire situation. Lynn Jacobson, the chair of the Alberta Farm Federation, has long been calling on shippers to increase their capacity, and we have been calling for this too for months. Like everyone else, Canada grain producers have bills and loans to pay off, and the banks will not wait for them. We are therefore urging the government, or we have been urging the government, to take measures for several months now in order to obtain concrete results for farmers. It is completely unacceptable, unacceptable that farmers who work hard should not be able to transport their grain. In my opinion, this bill does not go far enough. Touch one, and I met with farmers who told me what effect this transportation crisis had on their bottom line. I had a chance to better understand the situation and how complex it is. In fact, one farmer I met with made a map for me. This map now hangs in my office and has come in quite handy. A few things have become very clear to me thanks to his explanation. For one, prices. Producers are seeing a large gap between the farm gate price and what they're seeing at the port. The most recent numbers I've seen are from March 19th. The price in Davidson was 575 per bushel, and the price at the port of Vancouver for the same period was 1060 per bushel. That's half, Mr. Speaker. I'm disappointed to see that given the crisis is costing $8.3 billion in lost sales, there is still no direct compensation for farmers. I would have liked to have seen measures in this bill that would have compensated farmers for their losses. When I met with farmers in Saskatchewan, one of them told me he felt lucky. Lucky because he had a, his crop had been destroyed by a hailstorm a, a hail recently. He was lucky because, because he had crop insurance, and he came out on top of most farmers despite that hailstorm. This isn't how farming should work, Mr. Speaker. Our farmers produce a record bumper crop. They should be able to reap those rewards, not be penalized for years to come. Another farmer told me he sold high-grade grain to feed because he could get a higher price than shipping it. That might be good news for the hog industry. We might be seeing some very healthy hogs this year. But for the grain producers, this, isn't, this, this is completely unacceptable. The other thing I understand from the map is that transportation logistics is extremely complex in this country. Some farmers I met mentioned that there is no plan to reduce the, to replace the important work of the former iteration of the CWB. The NDP opposed the undemocratic and reckless gutting of the Canadian Wheat Board. We could see how important it is to have strong institutions representing our farmers and helping solve logistical issues in their interests. I want to talk briefly about the grain capacity. When the minister presented the order in council on March 7th, farmers knew right away this was not going to be enough. The minister is requiring that rail trans the rail companies move 1 million metric tons a week. That amount is what the railways always said they could do. So in the end, they are forcing the railways to do something that they were already going to do. Here is a quote from Lyle Stewart, the minister of agriculture from Saskatchewan. He says, and I quote, at first blush, the legislation itself is deficient. We made some substantial asks, and the, the numbers weren't pulled out of the air. They were numbers that we got from industry, and we know that they were achievable. We believe that 13,000 cars a week of grain could be unloaded, for instance, without handicapping other commodities that need cash flow, that need flow from Western Canada. And we thought $250,000 a day penalties were not out of compliance. It's clear that the government could have done more from the railways. It is high time that the government take action, but this bill does not go far enough. The minister is trying to clean up a mess that he should have been able to foresee and prevent. The measures he is proposing will expire in two years, so this is not a long-term solution and it will not prevent such a situation from happening again. This government lacks vision. Several agro agronomists and officials from the Department of Agriculture have said that crop yields will only grow. This bill does nothing to find long-term solutions for farmers. 
In addition, most of the measures proposed in the bill will not come into force until later, whereas the problem is real and is happening now, Mr. Speaker. The fact that this bill will expire in two years means that the Conservatives see this matter as being a short-term problem. And yet, Mr. Speaker, this is a structural problem that farmers must deal with. In the next few crop years, this problem will likely occur again. The minister has, did not listen to the requests of the provinces that have been hardest hit. They wanted harsher fines, compensation for grain producers, an increase in the minimum targets for, for uh, grain cars. As I said earlier, we regret that there is still no compensation for grain producers. Farmers have seen losses to the tune of $8.3 billion since the beginning of this crisis, and still they have no right to any kind of direct compensation. Never would the NDP abandon farmers this way. Now, we have been calling for harsher, or rather stricter arbitration and penalties, and we want the service level agreements to be respected. The Conservatives refused to adopt these changes six months ago, and now that they're dealing with a crisis, finally they've begun listening to us. And they should also listen to the Parliamentary Secretary, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Reflecting on the policy direction of this government. I would like to see this government have a comprehensive vision for agriculture in this country. Agriculture is so important. It represents one in eight jobs in this country. It is vital to our economy. And yet the minister is bringing in pieces of legislation that seems to be reacting to an issue rather than leading the way on ag issues. It seems that we only have the chance to debate agriculture-related bills in the House when something goes wrong. The latest grain transportation crisis is a good example of this. The government has waited months and months before acting and then scrambling together a bill that could help farmers get the grain moving. This bill only acts when it needs to and delays action as much as possible. I wish we could work together. I'm looking forward to having witnesses at committee, but I'm really hoping the government can agree to accept amendments and actually work together. So I'm looking forward to some questions and seeing this bill come to committee, have witnesses and make this a better bill that will actually support farmers, get grain moving and prevent this problem from happening in the future. Uh, the House is, uh, is once more dealing with legislation to patch up the grain handling and transportation system in Western Canada. Just about a year ago, we were doing exactly the same thing. Back then, it was called Bill C-52, legislation to create service-level agreements between shippers and railways. Just about everybody told the government at that time that Bill C-52, as originally presented, would not work. But the Conservatives refused to listen to any of that advice. They refused each and every amendment. They voted them down. They told farmers and others basically to get stuffed. They put on the whips and they voted against every single idea that was presented to the Standing Committee to try and make Bill C-52 useful. They forced it through with absolutely no change. And sure enough, as everybody predicted at the time, it failed. Not a single service level agreement was ever completed under the useless Bill C-52. And that is one of the reasons why the grains industry is now in such chaos. Grain shipments are months and months and millions of tons behind. Piles of crop are stranded on farms across the prairies. Some is now spoiling. Feed users and domestic processors can't get the supplies they need. Terminals are half empty. Ships are waiting. Demurrage charges are uh, horrendous. Many sales have been outright lost. Others have been deferred. And the prairie price is now down by 35 or 40 percent compared to where it was last year. Good customers like the Japanese are simply going elsewhere to buy the grain that they would normally come to Canada to get. World Grain Conferences are talking incessantly about, quote, the unreliable Canadian grain system. Some farmers have not had any income since last year. They're rolling last year's debt into next year's debt. And add all that together, 
and by the government's own calculation, as specified in their March 7th Order in Council, the impact of this disaster is now in the range of some $8 billion in costs and losses. $8 billion scooped out of the prairie farm economy, most of that taken directly from the pockets of farmers. The problem has been dragging on for very nearly six months now, and the best the, cover the government can forecast is that it will take another six months, another six long painful months, to clear the backlog that now exists. Grain companies are going to have a banner year. The deductions that they are taking off farmers' checks have never been higher. Railways are going to have a banner year. In fact, they have gone to New York and boasted to their shareholders that this year's grain problem is just a, quote, modest little thing. And don't worry, they say to their shareholders, grain shippers are captive shippers anyway. There is no other way to move the product. There are no serious financial penalties for not moving it. So eventually, the railways will get paid in full. The only one here who is out of pocket for that $8 billion is the farmer. So crisis legislation is obviously necessary. Indeed, it's long overdue. So how did this mess arise? Well, everyone blames everyone else. And they blame the weather. And they blame a big crop that came from the bumper harvest last year. It's always somebody else's fault. And no one is responsible. And no one is accountable for the failure and for the damages. But think of the painfully damaging message that that sends to prairie farmers. Of all of the participants in the grain system, farmers are the ones who did their jobs very well last year. They produced maybe the best crop in history. And now the system is saying to them, don't you dare do that again, because all the rest of us in the system can't handle anything more than just an average crop. Neither do we have the will to give grain any sense of priority. So you, the farmer, you just be content with mediocrity. That's what the system is saying to farmers by this massive failure this past year. Well, that's simply not good enough. The system failed farmers this past year. It failed badly. And there's responsibility all around for the railways, for the grain companies, maybe even a little bit for the cold winter. But if the system failed, then this is the question that must be asked. Who designed the system? Who put it in place? Who set it up for failure? Who has imposed $8 billion in costs and losses on prairie farmers? And the unequivocal answer to that question is this government of Canada. This disastrous system, the one that has failed so badly, is the one that was designed and implemented over the past three years by this government. And that is where the buck has to stop. So we're faced with Bill C-30. I think one thing in the bill that almost everybody, except the railways, would applaud is the change with respect to interswitching. That will possibly simulate competition at a great many more delivery points across the prairies. And that would be a good thing. I note that some of the farm organizations are welcoming this move. They're also describing it as a modest improvement, but it is an improvement. And we all hope that it will work. The legislation also re-legislates that order in council from March the 7th the one that ordered the railways to move a certain volume of grain in a certain time frame. But significantly, the legislation does not improve upon the order that was made on the 7th of March. The railways will not be asked to do significantly better than they would otherwise have done anyway with the onset of spring. So the question is, why not? And that's the question that's being asked so eloquently by the Minister of Agriculture in the province of Saskatchewan. And this is a very practical, business-like, down-to-earth minister. He is a no-nonsense kind of guy. 
and he would not propose a volume or a penalty system that was outlandish or outrageous or impossible to achieve. The province of Saskatchewan, through the minister, has asked for about an 18% increase in the volumes to be shipped and penalties to be at the rate of $250,000 a day instead of $100,000 a day. He's looked at it, he's examined it carefully as someone who knows the system, and he is saying, why not? That would help too, if the government can have a positive answer to Minister Stewart. The rest of C-30 is largely enabling legislation to authorize the creation of future regulations. There is no immediate action. It is simply future hypotheticals if regulations are ultimately forthcoming. So you ask the question, why are there no legislative guarantees for farmers? A regulation can be changed by the stroke of a pen in the middle of the night. And right now, no one knows what those regulations might say. It would be very helpful if the government would table the draft regulations before the Standing Committee, so the Standing Committee would know what those regulations are likely to do when they finally come in. For example, will there be comprehensive monitoring from one end of the system to the other to measure, analyze, and report publicly on grain marketing, transportation, and handling, and the outcomes that the system is actually generating? Will there be complete transparency? Will there be regulation on the basis calculations and the deductions that come off farmers' grain checks and go into the pockets of grain companies? The, that basis spread today has never been wider in Canadian history, meaning the grain companies are getting a lot of money and the farmers are getting less. Will there be any sensible business-like coordination of grain handling and transportation logistics? to replace the absolutely chaotic free-for-all that exists today. No one is out there directing traffic, so you've got a snarled mess. What about short lines? What about producer cars? These were the issues raised by the Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Foreign Affairs. What about servicing domestic customers, like the, like the feed grain users in the Fraser Valley and the, and the, uh, the cereal manufacturers in Eastern Canada? Will there be a full costing review to track all revenues and costs to follow the money in the grain system to see how the efficiency gains have been shared or not shared over the past 22 years when there was the last costing review? Will there be any new capacity or surge capacity in those service level agreements? Will there be any precise definition about what service the railways must provide? How will performance be measured? And will farmers get liquidated damages when the system fails? Penalties paid to the government don't help farmers. The damages need to be paid to the farmers who've incurred the losses. And why, Mr. C Mr. Speaker, has all of this been left out of C30? It's been left to be done by regulation maybe sometime. Why were these specific amendments voted down when they were last considered by the government a year ago in the context of Bill C-52? And when will farmers get to see any of those proposed draft regulations? I think it would be very wise for the government to make sure that farmers and all of us have a chance to review those regulations before the Standing Committee is called upon to vote on Bill C-30. Mr. Speaker, and finally, will this government accept common sense amendments to try to fix the mess in grain handling and transportation in the interests of farmers who, I repeat, are the ones and the only ones who are picking up the tab for all of this disaster. Concerns about the inadequacy of Bill C-30 have obviously been expressed by many members of Parliament on all three sides of this House, uh, and concern is coming from others as well. I mentioned the Minister of Agriculture in the province of Saskatchewan that the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities has expressed concern, the Saskatchewan Canola Growers Association, uh, and of course the, uh, the Parliamentary Secretary. As this bill goes speedily through second reading today, which I think it should, and into the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food for detailed consideration, the government needs to ensure that all of those who have these concerns all of those who are going to be vitally affected, for better or for worse, 
by the outcome of Bill C-30 have the opportunity to be heard. Uh, there are only about four meetings of the committee normally scheduled between now and when the House would adjourn at Easter. This matter has to be resolved before the Easter break. I think it would be very important for us to hear from all parties today saying explicitly that whatever extra hours or extra meetings of the Agriculture Committee may be required to make sure that all the witnesses are heard, that those meetings and, and hours will be added to the committee's agenda so that we can have a full ventilation of this subject. No one will feel that they've been shut down or cut off and that we can all be assured that when the final decisions are taken, the full information was before the committee and the decision is taken with full knowledge of what, in fact, the circumstances are. Uh, for part of the Liberal Party, we are more than happy to have as many meetings as it takes to make sure that everybody gets heard. I think that's what I heard from the, from the uh, Deputy Agriculture Critic for the NDP, and I hope the government would give us that assurance before the end of the afternoon so that we can all make sure that the Agri Agriculture Committee does its job properly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.